Smash like. We're going to go into the infinite. Like I said, we may have, and beyond. We may have to. Uh, <laughs> we may have to redo the uh, middle part, but that's okay. Wow. So, so the into the infinite. We're going into the. We're going towards the monolith, monolith. whatever it is. We yeah. we don't know, um, and we don't see it for very long. No, we don't. Um, we, we transition. Don't even see it like does he enter? We don't see him enter the monolith. You no. never see it. It's uh, um, simply it's viewed from his perspective, but outside of the pod. Um, and as we approach the monolith, uh, there's suddenly a, a burst of light that emanates from the center of the screen and, and grows out, and then we begin to see all these colorful um, effects of the slit scan uh, camera technology that if you were to show it to a youngster they would assume it was uh, early computer graphics and right but it's by not. god that's absolutely what it looks like it, it looks like you couldn't achieve these effects with anything other than than advanced computer graphics but nope it's old-fashioned analog um using some uh, some clever trickery sure like like taking the camera and going like this yeah, that does happen. So that Bowman um, looks like he's you shaking, know, yeah, encountering massive gravitational forces or something, or something. And and again, this is where well, I'm assuming like a, like a black hole. I'm I'm assuming he, like an event, like not the you know yeah. I mean? like he's being there's something yeah. going going on that's extraordinary. You know? There's something extraordinary and. Uh, we really don't see, we see uh, Bowman in uh, the shaking. Okay, so, and he's, he's squinting. Um, so there's, feels to him like there's some kind of physical trauma. So um, we're, so we're, so we're having that, that's done and it's done in regular camera. Like it's done yeah. in regular motion. There's, yeah. And he, and we're, so we're able to be a test pilot. We're able to like feel, get a, he's priming us, right? Yep. So I think that Kubrick is taking us from this sterile, you know, this more cerebral scene with the syzygy and the tumbling, mm -hmm. you know, monolith mm -hmm. and the beautiful thing. And now mm -hmm. he's like, okay, I'm going to make you feel something. Right. Right. Yeah. right. Yeah. This, this isn't the, this isn't the quiet desolation of space anymore. No. We're going somewhere. Yeah. And it's, it's violent and it's active. Kubrick's reaching his hand out and he's like, wake up. Right. 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 Because I'm, because I'm going to show you some real stuff. You wait till you see this. Yeah, exactly. This is exactly. all the tricks that he had up his sleeve 10 years before this movie was made. Well, right. many of them. Right. And it's it's interesting that you bring that up. I, I hadn't thought about it at all. But there has to be a way, there has to be a distinct break between um, all of the journey of discovery up to this point, which is that quiet, you're in space, it's silent. Um, there has to be a way to shake you out of that uh, to prep you for now you're into the psych the real psychological portion of the movie um, there has to be a transition to that part he uses it he does it visually but he also does it with the music as well so the music is the Lizetti, the Ligeti music yes when we're looking at the 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 crazy i mean not the um the beauty you know yes. of of the jupiter the jovian system but then the music like kind of it, it changes it's it's subdued i think it's just really sound and then there's music there's more ligeti music but it's different that's right there's there's um there's a combination of sound like rumbling yes um and then there's a transition back to that ligeti music right um so we see um we see the i'm trying to remember which comes first um there's the oh, no no first first we see uh what looked like uh, stars being formed, galaxies. Well, I I disagree. I think I think first we see streaks. So okay. we see the split. Oh, you're right. You're screen, right. Right. Yes. And on one side we see a certain pattern of streaks, and on the other side we see a different pattern of streaks. Red yeah. and green. I forget yeah. which yeah. way it starts, but we That's see right. that, and it's it's like. So for me, you know, obviously there's the sense of motion, right? Mm -hmm. So you're traveling. But you're also, it seems like traveling at very, very high speed. Right, right. right. Yeah, least, absolutely. That's, that's what I'm getting from that. Now imagine, imagine seeing these effects in 1968. Oh yeah. I mean, I'll tell you, they hold up now. Yeah. They hold up now. Um, and um, before I had read the making of, how did they get these effects? 
I remember staring at it just a few years ago thinking, how the hell did they do this? <laughs> well, so in particular, the, the, after we go through some of the, uh, the colored streaks, which look like computer animation, then we go into that, what looks like stars being born or galaxies right. forming something unknown, but clearly cosmic. Are we looking back in time? Who knows? Right. And I remember looking at those effects again, thinking, how was that achieved? Now that I know how it was, it's like, it's like I'm in any magic trick. When you know how the magic trick is done, you're like, oh, of course, it's obvious. Well, don't tell right. me because I, I won't tell you. I won't yeah. tell you. I won't tell you, but it it's still very cool. I mean, even even if you even if you know how, it's still very cool. Um, well, I just kind of came up with this kind of progression of these images and an interpretation of them. And I kind of want to let that kind of mm -hmm. oil in my mind for a couple of months because I I never I don't know that I ever dissected it as much of this just because we were gonna do this video. I actually right. like sat there and went like, well, wait a minute. Right. This looks like a scene from Koyan Scotsi. This looks like technology taken from an aerial view. At least that's what those first streaks, the mm -hmm. split screen streaks seem like mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And then and then the shapes start to become a little more organic. Mm -hmm. They they look like bubbly, like kind of like uh swirls of color, like right. you would take a paint in a glycerin or something like and swirl it around you're, you're not far you're not far off how close, it huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. did you ever see the the test where um they've done that where they'll take a cylinder and they'll put paint pellet paint drops in it and this is to talk about organization chaos theory and they'll stir it like four times this way and it's completely swirled and then they'll stir it four times back and the, the, mixes. the droplets look almost the same as they were originally yeah i think i've it's seen really that. It, that has more to do with like fluid mediums. Mm -hmm. I think it has to do with anything that any esoteric is trying to prove by that, but it's just a really neat experiment. Totally. Yeah. And then, um, and then, and as he's going through, instead of the, the shaky rumbly, we now see- Now it's these, still shots, still shots. Yeah. And yeah. he's like turning away from it, but he can't take his eyes off it. It's like, it's terrifying, but- I yeah. still have to look at it because but, but exactly but not only that you it's so much more effective those those brief almost subliminal still shots are so more much more effective at convincing you that he's seeing something that is just shredding his sanity he's seeing things that are incomprehensible and he, he could have a, a lesser director would have had him uh i don't know sitting in a sound studio going ah and screaming or things like that Right. Um, again, okay. but but because there's no motion and it's still shot, still shot, still shot. Psychologically, it's much more powerful than than showing a regular full motion actor screaming in a helmet. You sound a little like Daffy Duck when you did that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I've never been so insulted in all my life. Duck Dodgers in the 23rd and a half century. century. I love that one. Uh, yeah. The, the and then it just goes with the blinking eye. Well, smash like the blinking eye right okay so the blinking eye i mean that's how we still know it's it's he's dave a, yes he, he's still having a human experience yes i completely agree and, and that's to ground us because we're not seeing those flashes of of him anymore right now it's something else it's it's we're he's experiencing something beyond the material realm at this right point, right, right. It, He's still, it's still, his humanity's still there, but it's mm -hmm. more about the consciousness. He can't show a brain because that would be icky and wouldn't make a lot of sense. Totally. It's it's like so much else in the movie. It's all taking place here in the viewer's mind. Yeah. And it's us too. It's us looking back at ourselves. And it's the, it's, and, and it's, it's, you know, back to Blade Runner. I mean, like the, the imagery of the eye, you know, and the, the idea of the window of the soul, you know, and you can go into all that kind of imagery as well. well. I mean, anytime, anytime you put a single eye on a 70 millimeter cinemascope theater screen, it's extremely powerful. <laughs> um, I just want to mention uh, a piece about the, the aliens that um, he struggled with this because again, in consulting with, with experts, um, they basically said, you know, that, yeah, there's uh, other life that might be out there would, it would be life, but not in a way that would necessarily be recognizable to us as life. Right. It wouldn't look like anything that you could conceive of, or most likely would not. 
So he struggled with trying to, uh, he gave art directors or, or the artists uh, an impossible directive. Look like something that, uh, draw me something that uh, has never existed in a color that doesn't exist. Right? Oh. So, you know, what do you do with that? Um, and I saw some of the sketches and they are way out there. Yeah. I mean, way out there. I guess um, Geiger wasn't one of them. And, and uh, even Geiger is not close to some of these drawings. They're just... Oh. They, they look like creatures, but not in any conventional sense. So I, I thought they really hit the mark if you're trying to go for, for what an exomorph might really look like. Um, but in the end, he decided like Sorry, so many- what? An exomorph? Yeah, exomorph. Another bug hunt. <laughs> he, he decided that um, none of these efforts uh, were sufficiently weird enough. And that the best thing to do is to not show them at all. Which well, is which is in the end why we don't see the aliens, which which clearly now was the right move, or do we, or do we? Yeah, that's so, a good question. So let's keep going. So we're yeah. going. So we're doing the landscape. Well, we're not. The yes. landscape, but, so we're doing. Okay. So we get the elliptical galaxy. Yes. Right. That. Yeah. That star thing you were talking about—that exploding yeah. star. I mean, that looks yeah. like computer graphics. Uh huh. How do you do that one? I want to know that. I don't know. I mean, there there oh. are some of the, some effects. Uh, I I don't recall reading exactly how they were done. So that could be. I know, like when they did like um, Deep Space Nine, they were doing Babylon Five was doing special effects at the same time. DS Nine was doing uh, exploding spaceship models, and um, they were still doing the practical effects. And, right. And and it was still cost them three times as much to do it, but that mm -hmm. was just the way they did it. And what they did was, um, in order to simulate um, zero gravity explosions, they would have the camera on the ground and they would explode it above. So the, you would have a radial explosion and, yep. and then the stuff would fall down. So yep. maybe that's a shower of sparks coming down on a camera lens. I have no idea. But like, or, you know, but it, it's... Uh, that that effect could be made i was just curious how he did it but if you don't know that's fine. that one i don't know yeah. i i actually suspect that's another um uh paint and emulsion uh trick oh. uh, uh okay. trans uh, transparent liquids um colored that are that's lit. just black and white at that, that point I think. that are lit. yeah so some of those other ones though are, are colored fluids that are lit by super high intensity lamps um yeah so that, that to me, okay, now I'm going to start getting real. Let's read into this stuff. So, so that to me is the elliptical galaxy, right? That's the universe showing itself off, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, okay, you're, you're, we, now we're going to show you something. Mm -hmm. Look how cool the universe is. Look mm -hmm. at me. I'm the universe. Boom. I yeah, can do you've, this. You've it's never like seen this before. The perfect spherical pattern of stars. Brilliant white, the whitest white you could see. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. look, look at this. And then they start to get more, uh, I use the word inchoate, right? They mm -hmm, get mm -hmm. more like um, um, primal, primeval, you know, like, like forms like, um, like almost like a jellyfish. Mm -hmm. One of them reminds me of like a, like a, yeah. like a jelly, like a sea jelly. Yes. Maybe not with the tendrils. There, there are some long tendrils that come off. Yeah. yeah. And then, and then the further back, it's almost like you're going, further back into the the beginning of the universe and mm -hmm. the formations are becoming more like primitive mm -hmm. you know less organized until right. finally there's one that almost it's red it's towards the top of the screen and it's kind of reddish in color it's almost like whenever you see um uh pictures of like a fetus in the womb yeah you know it has that like kind of blood blood color mm -hmm. to it yep. you know which i the, i i it's like the lifeblood of the universe. <laughs> to quote, well, I just watched uh, Big Trouble in Little China. So that's a line in, in Big Trouble in Little China where he's like, what's that? Lifeblood of the universe. What's that? <laughs> you know? And then there's one actually at the bottom right hand corner of the screen. It almost looks like a spermatozoa. It's like a, did you get that? It was like a, it's like a it's like a white blob and has a yes. very short tail. But it yes. was almost, to me it was almost. I got like, I got that. You got the sense of birth, right? I got that. Yep. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad I'm not the only one. All right, so all right, cool. And then I see other ones that are shaped like mouths and eyes. 
Yeah. But then we get to the aliens. Yep. Um, well, we go over some landscapes, which um, suggest so, that he's, he's reaching his destination. So to me, right before the landscapes, there's the seven diamonds, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's that, kind of the most, one of the most mysterious parts of the whole thing for me. Those are the aliens to me. Um, I think that's possible. They're in organized form. Yep. They're changing, they're pulsing. They're mm -hmm. like, they're changing patterns inside mm -hmm. of their pattern. Mm -hmm. they're they're flying in an organized formation mm -hmm. they're like you know like ufo kind of sighting kind of stuff mm -hmm. but they're all they're flying with mm -hmm. him past the landscape mm -hmm. almost as if they're guiding the pod with that this is this is totally my interpretation I have no idea yeah but i i don't i don't think that's an unreasonable interpretation because um, there's seven of them equally distanced you know, almost like flying in a V formation. I just, I but don't not know. Not only that, that not only that, they're, they're geometric objects in a, in yes. a landscape that up to this point has been nothing but uh, largely abstract patterns. Yeah. Or stellar patterns, you know, or like things patterns. the universe would create, but this looks like something created by an intelligence to me. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I think that's entirely possible because I, that, that, that sequence with the diamonds is, uh, is, probably always been one of the most baffling ones it's the one that stands out from the other ones because the other ones are landscapes and starscapes right yeah. and yeah. emulsions you yeah. know artistic yeah i don't know how now, they achieved the diamond effect but um i, I it doesn't I, I like it i mean so uh either interpretation neither one bothers me you know to say that well this is just some other weird phenomenon he's observing or that this is manifestation of the alien presence which has brought him here both of those work perfectly fine for me smash like this is you know because i you know i'm i'm thinking benevolent superior you know civilization they seem to be benevolent um they're very patient um they they may have allowed proto-humans to survive uh, from the very beginning, because again, the implication is that those primitive beings might have been on their way out because they um, would have been outcompeted. Yeah, the leopards would have got them, or right. uh, yeah, exactly. The tapers would have ate the last of their food. You know? And that brings us to the hotel room. Well, I won't even say hotel room, bedroom, bedroom suite. Um, and as you yeah. astute, as you astutely pointed out, when he arrives, um. We don't immediately see him. We see his perspective from inside the pod looking out. The pod is still there because the screens are now registering malfunction. Non, yeah, non-function. And then the... Um, so there's still a tie back to the reality that we came from. The briefly. transition, the cinematic transition to that moment too is on his, is from the psychedelic thing that we just saw to back to the, to the more traditional like prop. Mm -hmm. is his eye again it's the psychedelic color and then the colors bleed out to a realistic looking mm -hmm. eye right mm -hmm. so it's actually like kira delia's eye mm -hmm. i assume mm -hmm. um because he does have pretty striking like grayish uh, super striking blue eyes yeah, they really they really stick it, out it makes you wonder if he was cast for that you know like if that was a contributing factor in the in the fact that he was cast that role, I don't know I why don't. he was. Uh, I don't know why he was cast. Um, uh, I, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, he, yeah, I don't. He was just coming off of uh, a, a movie that I only saw maybe three or four years ago. Uh, what happened to Bunny? Something I can't remember the last name of the character. It's a, it's a, it's, a, it's a good movie. You should check it out. It's a it's a whodunit. Uh, Lawrence Olivier is is the detective. Olivier uh, and. Uh, Kier Delay is, is a suspect. Um, uh, he talks a lot more than he does in this movie. And it, it kept me guessing um, because Bunny, I can't remember what the last name is, uh, the, the eponymous subject has disappeared uh, very inexplicably. Where has she gone? Um, check it out. It's black and Funny white. Why did you say Bunny? Because I have in my notes here that Bowman is like a scared rabbit being taken to the vet. <laughs> 
That's he's, exactly, yeah, right. He's, he's sitting out of his in element. that pod and he doesn't know what to do next. And he's just like, oh my God, what, what just can you happened, do? right? What can, he has no idea. He, he's not even really himself anymore. No. Uh, well, he's, he's, he's traumatized. He's traumatized, traumatized for sure. And interestingly, and I think this is an interesting choice by Kubrick, that when he emerges from the pod, um, and for one scene, the pod is still there. And then the next scene, the pod is gone. Yes. But you see that Bowman has aged uh, inside that helmet. How long did the journey take? Did the journey take years in his time? Did it take as long as it took in the movie uh, seconds? And that the, uh, the journey is so hard on the human body that it caused that kind of aging? We don't know. So I think we're led to believe through some indications of uh, Bowman's um, the age, the human aging process, if you want to call it that, that uh, time is is not operating at the same. Right. You know, it's just it's right. time is either immaterial here or it's or it's just off. So you have he he first examines the bathroom which I don't even remember seeing before in previous yeah. viewings. So I'm sure it's always been there and it just didn't register with me. Same. But the bedroom is the more, is, is the more iconic scene. So that's the one that I guess stuck with me. Uh, but he first looks at the, bed, at the bathroom. And then as you mentioned earlier, he hears something or senses something behind him in the, in the main bedroom. And he slowly turns around. Now, after having been through this traumatic experience led by a, what we assume is an alien intelligence, what's behind him? And he turns so slowly and there's no noise. Everything is dead silent. There's no music this time, nothing. So it's that psychological terror of what, what's in the room with me. Uh, and he turns around and of course he sees himself, but an older version of himself, even older than, older than he was coming out of the, the portal. Um, but he's in a, uh, a smoking jacket or a bathrobe um having a leisurely meal lunch or dinner what does this all mean what's what's happening what's going on here what so do they, they don't make eye contact he doesn't make eye contact with himself right so he's he in not. the face suit and he no, sees, he the sees back himself of his eating head. he sees himself eating yeah. but they never they never look at each other right and then the and then the the man at the table the bowman at the table in the smoking jacket senses something right you see the back of his head he kind of goes yeah yeah and then he looks and there's nothing there but he gets right. up out of his chair to investigate and it's this kind of brilliant way of uh, again um how should i say it uh he he cooper is keeping you off balance He's keeping you completely confused as to what's happening here you don't know what to make of it. I mean, when you're watching the movie in real time, you have no clue. It's only later when you come out that you have to, you're like, hmm, you got to think about it, or you got to watch it again, or you got to watch it again and again, or you got to re read somebody else's interpretation in the magazine as to what happened. Yeah. So is the, is the hotel room a zoo? Is he being kept there in what the alien intelligence assumes is an environment? that is a natural environment for his species right is it or is it in his mind is the room not physically real but it's it's something that's happening in his mind um how much time is elapsing between the time that one version of himself looks at another version is it real time or is a lot of time is is he is he living out a is he like picard in in the uh that uh, great episode of TNG where he lives an entire other existence. The inner yeah, light. Just, the inner light. Is it like that? We really can't be sure. We don't know. We don't know. It's not really important. But it's one of those things is happening. It's a dreamscape. So, you know, I don't know if uh, I actually was talking about a lot of this stuff today. Um, was talking about the idea of the human zoo as a uh, possible explanation for the uh, Fermi paradox. Hmm. Um, the uh, the idea of like um, lucid dreaming, which I experimented with a couple times, and uh, not not even like intention, but like just 
you ever do you ever like eat too much pasta lay down on the couch and just have one of those like great naps and mm-hmm. you're like you, you got the radio on or a television on oh yeah i've had you fall asleep but you're lightly dreaming yep and you have a dream that lasts a week in the dream but you're on the same track of the song when you wake up you've disoriented I have no way to explain how that happens uh-huh. but that's what's it's altered consciousness on. That's what's going on in this scene yeah, to me. I think I think that's a good interpretation. And and uh, you know when he turns to investigate where he just was, the earlier version of the spacesuit, it's almost like an echo of the a psychic echo of the past. Right. You know, right. so we're we're getting a sense of time. We're getting a sense of distorted time. You know, yeah. not human. What a, what a, what a, a brilliant scene, a scene that when I first saw it, I came out thinking I don't know what the hell that was. <laughs> what, what's what really i came out thinking what is the meaning of the white hotel room um but now you know it, it's 30 plus years since the first time i saw it and i've seen it you know many many times since then um now it all seems pretty straightforward but what he did was he he basically tackled the problem of how do i show what a dream is like and the example you just gave is perfect. I mean, he's he's literally showing you what what a version of a dream is like in this mind bending location after you've just been transported either backwards in time, forwards in time, across the universe, timeless, uh, timeless uh, area where time has no meaning. Any right. of these things are a possibility. We all know what's going. On. Uh, you're you've been converted to pure energy. You exist only as thought. Right. Any of any of these possibilities exist. Smash like. Let's, you, I want to get in a little bit of the symbolism before we. Oh, jump. well, you you mentioned uh, the breaking of the glass. Yeah, so that, that's how Kubrick makes the transition from middle aged Bowman to the really elderly Bowman. He hmm. knocks over the glass because of his clumsiness. I don't know. What do you think? I wasn't thinking about that. That's really great. Well, first, I wanted to say something about shapes. So, so we've been talking about the obelisk. We've been talking about rectangular shapes. Rectangular shapes meaning like um, either um, the alien intelligence mostly or artificial intelligence, um, you know, in the case of Hal. Hal's kind of both, right? So like Hal is the rectangle, but he's also the circle. He's also a circle, right? yeah. So the circle implies an eye, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, very strongly. And of course we see Bowman's eye when we're going through the 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 stargate right Mm -hmm. and uh on the table this may be a stretch but that's what we're here for that's what we're here for the the on the table the serving trays are rectangular with lids but the plate is round and it's like to me the round is the human symbol right Mm -hmm. And the and the and the and the rectangle is the alien symbol. So it's like, it's like you know the aliens are providing him with food. He takes it from the presumably from those trays, puts mm-hmm. it on his round plate, and then it becomes. I I mean I know I'm really reaching here, but but I don't think that there's a misplaced object in that room. I think that Kubrick put every single object in that room for a purpose. I tend to agree with you only because everything else that he did is was so deliberate. Uh, uh, nothing, nothing in any shot that he did um, appears to be casual. And people that worked with him on this film talk about this a lot, that uh, it, it's often, it's often um, turned into a cartoonish version of him that he was obsessive. Right. No, he was deliberate. The way they describe it is that he was not obsessive. It's that he knew what he wanted. Yeah. And he wanted his people to deliver exactly what he asked for. I, I um, admire that. Right. So um, I, that supports your idea that in a, in a scene, particularly a scene that is as sparse, as sparsely populated with objects as the, the end room scene is, um, I would have to imagine that everything was considered, you know, not placed randomly, not chosen randomly. Well, those chairs look really darn comfortable. I have to tell you, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a chair like that in my house. Yeah. Um, the bed looks really comfortable too. The bed does look pretty comfortable, although it's a bit large for my taste. The for food something. looks really good, right? Like it's like a full plate of food that yeah. he's tucking into there, man. Yes. Like he is having a meal, right? Yes. 
What? Let you me ask you a question. Yeah, go I, ahead. Have a, I have a different memory of that end sequence. So he's he's eating as as the middle stage Bowman in in the jacket. Yeah. I feel like I remember one where he was really elderly, you know, hairless in the white suit, eating soup. Am I misremembering that? Or maybe that well, was in 2010. I don't know. No, I don't think that's in 2010. But you you you've just sparked uh maybe a false memory like maybe now i'm inserting a memory that it i could be a false before. memory but the the thing That's, is that i like i he like cut, he cut 15 or 20 minutes out after maybe, the first showing maybe we saw it in a different version or and maybe i'm, I'm just wondering yeah i'm just wondering if it's possible that i've, I've seen an alternate version uh um, oh, yeah, every, everybody says out. there is no such thing as a director's cut of 2001 because when he shortened it it was because he wanted to shorten it because when he when he finally saw it with the audience he realized there were certain um sequences that just lasted too long yeah and he had to put an intermission in anyway because it was already two and a half hours long right, right. how much longer could it be i the yeah. um the scene with the uh broken glass mm -hmm. so All right, you are, we're talking Christ imagery, right? Mm -hmm. Is this his last supper, right? I mean, it's his last oh, meal. It's his last that's, meal. That's an interesting, his last meal, yeah. I mean, is he a condemned man or is it just his last like sensual pleasure of eating before he becomes transformed into an other world? Is, it his, is it his last worldly act? You know what I mean? Oh, totally. Because yeah, like, I mean, What's yeah, he's ingesting. He's Obviously ingesting. He doesn't food. have a companion, so he can't have sex. But like, you know, he's ingesting food. It's it's a, it's a pleasurable sensation. He's got a good meal, as you, as you observed. But it could be like the Matrix, where it's like he's imagining he's having this meal. He's not you know, physically really having it. I love that. Um, and the idea, the idea that this is an imagination uh, or a dream, it's not actually happening. Also, very likely. Sure. Uh, I love that idea. The Last Supper. So, but that's not all. So, so he, he, he breaks the, the glass, right? Yeah. So it's not the only glass on the table, right? Mm -hmm. Well, but it he, never is. You got to have a water glass and a wine glass. So which one does he break? Yeah. That I didn't notice. That I, didn't I did. Know. Wine. Yeah. Is it the wine? You know how I know? Uh -uh. All right. So here's how I know. Now, I don't know. Maybe you can tell by the placement of the glasses. I'm not that, you know, yeah, I don't, I would, I don't I'd have to look eat with it. my pinky extended, so I don't know these things. I, I try, but, but he takes he at one point he's eating, and he takes the glass and he drinks, mm -hmm. and he looks at it. He does. He regards it, almost admiring it. Like, yes. Yep. That's, that's a damn really good. good glass of wine. Yeah. And puts right. it down because you don't do that with water. I mean, nowadays you might do it with water. Nah, that's nowadays great point. Nowadays you might go. Well, that's Aquafina, yeah. but I really prefer Sal no, Pellegrino. I get, but, I always get tap water at the table. Thank you. But this is, that's a wine. You're right. I, I, I remember since I just watched it last night. You're right. He, he takes a moment and he, he looks at it and he does admire it. Yeah. So you're right. That is the wine glass. So that's the wine glass. That is Christ imagery. He knocks it over, it breaks. Yeah. Right. Yes. So we all know what wine in the, you know, sacrament is christ's blood right yes so he, yes yes so he spills the blood right yeah and he is about to expire from his mortal existence and that's become right. something else semi-divine right yes. so for me that's that's the christ that's the christ imagery for me in in the scene smash like that's a really cool because really why introduce the idea of eating into that entire sequence it's an it's not it's an odd choice because um you could have had you could have had the entire room oh. sequence without any kind of eating so i think there's a couple things going on here it is you have to espouse my theory that they're benevolent um right aliens and and they are taking care of him so they've right. given him very silk jackets slippers yeah i, I always took that to mean furniture, that, that wonderful as, bed, as far as they can tell food. from either observing humans or being able to extract something from his memory which is what i'm thinking that they're like 
this is this is uh, this is what a human most wants. This would Let's be a great the best. Yeah, it's be know? a great environment. He'll love it. Let's make him the best bed. You know, we'll get him the best dog bed. We'll give him a little like right. you know chew toy. We'll right. give him like the best. You know, we'll feed him cow can instead of that dry stuff. I don't even know if they make cow can anymore. But like you know, we'll 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 we'll, we'll really pamper this guy. It's his last day before we make him. The progenitor of the next version of his species. You know? Yeah, I, this all this all makes complete sense to me. Um, one small detail that I don't I don't know is it's particularly meaningful at all. It might have just been a, a, a particular bent that he was interested in at the time. Do you notice how on the space station the ceiling is completely eliminated when they're walking through the curved part, but in the in the end sequence room the floor is eliminated in pretty much exactly the same way. No. I, I noticed the floor was illuminated, but I did not notice the ceiling in contrast to that. Oh, in the space station, when he is uh, he's walking through the corridor, he encounters the Russians. Um, all the lighting is one hundred percent of the ceiling is is illuminated in exactly the same way that the floor of the of the of the room in the end sequence is. That is awesome. So up lighting, lighting from above versus lighting from below. So I mean. That's kind of an interesting thing that Kubrick chose to light the floor in that sequence rather than the ceiling. Why? Why would you do that? I, I it's, love it's, the it's, idea it's, of lighting the floor. I just it's thought it so was beautiful. But... It's so counterintuitive because, and it's a big pain in the ass. What is it saying? To, to have, the, have the stage people construct a set yeah. that's gonna be illuminated from below. Yeah. Is, is a bit of an ordeal so is, it's something that he similar? definitely he really wanted it for a reason was it just to make it seem other weird you know to to further uh drive in that sense of uh dreamlike state i mean i mean i could go out on a limb here um so go there so the lighting well, it, it could be a, a it could be a mo it very basic. It could be a motion of, it could be a, a symbolized motion. So, so man is here. The mm -hmm. light is here. Mm -hmm. Now man has risen above. So he's mm -hmm. he's becoming something else. It's mm -hmm. an ascension, maybe, in a symbolic way. I love it. Uh, just throwing it out there, like yeah, heaven. Yeah. You that's know, it, like it's, he's below heaven. Now he's above yeah. heaven. I I don't yeah. know. I mean, I'm throwing it's, that's again awful. it's it's the it's the beauty of uh of that sequence is that there are many possible I never noticed that that's wonderful but one thing that you reminded me going back to the space station is that when Dr. Floyd goes through customs and he talks mm -hmm. to the computer for the first time we ever see him interacting with mm -hmm. the computer or anybody mm -hmm. interacting with the computer in this movie mm -hmm. the computer right. asks him to like state his name his nationality and something Christian else. name Christian name and surname. Nice. Yeah. And I, he, they use the word Christian? Yes. And the reason I know that is that it really stuck out to me. Wow. Because I think that uh, if you said to a lot of people today, what's your Christian name? They wouldn't know what you're talking about. Yeah, exactly. That's pretty wild. I, I See, I, that passed me right up. Mm -hmm. but, but he actually says thank you to the computer. He does. Did you notice that? Yeah. So it's our, humanity, odd because, our humanity reflected on this device. This yeah, and I, th I, I took that to be that um, uh, we, we so reflexively say certain things uh, as uh, part of a trivial uh, politeness right. um, that he, it's just something that happened that he didn't think twice about. Exactly. And that's the point, I think, is that, you know, it's part of our nature to to have these niceties to have this courtesy yeah and it's and another it's another one of these you know meaningless interactions that later, almost all the characters have yeah and it's it's just it's it's a uh, contrast to what happens with Hal later you know right so so then he he reaches his final stage he's he's clearly uh on the literal deathbed uh and the monolith appears once more yeah um, the monolith is the consistent thread uh, from the beginning of the movie all the way to the very end. The monolith is the main character, I guess. The monolith, in some ways, the monolith is the main character that has no speaking lines. Um, well, it does. It's yeah. 
But it's so funny now that <laughs> that we've we've talked this all through, and because I've seen the movie so many times now, that the end scene just seems very obvious. And um, when I first saw it, it was totally baffling to me. I mean, it's like I I just I almost wrote off the whole end of the movie because like I don't know what that was. That was just weirdness. <laughs> <laughs> and now yeah after having watched this so many times and talked about it I'm like yeah it's obvious it's very clear what's happening you know the only thing we're really debating are some some possibilities around the edges right you know no i agree i but see we've um uh, watched it we've well remember what you said about uh listening to a song over and over you got the juice out of it yeah uh -huh. we got the juice i got the juice out of this movie uh-huh and you did too and it's um because i was at breakfast with uh a friend saturday and uh and i told him i said oh, he said what are your plans for this week i said oh i'm gonna be talking about 2001 space odyssey <laughs> and he's i said what a great job i have and he's like yeah yeah um he's like tell me about that he's like what happens at the end yeah. and i just basically gave him the the yeah. version like well you know he just digest trans version. transferred and you know he's transformed into the star child and he becomes a uh next form of life. yeah what does that mean i'm like well it's the future of humanity he's like the first of the the ascension into another um you know life form yeah. or a version of ourselves and he's like yeah. oh yeah i guess i never thought of it that way before yeah yeah like, what do you mean that's what it is no i'm just you know i mean like it's just well here's <laughs> there's still seems so obvious now but there's still something interesting about the very end when the star child appears <clears throat> he seems to be back on earth so not, uh, I'm also very interested in the fact that they really went out of their way to make a fetus that looked like the Can actor. Really, uh, yeah. it, it looks, I mean, the eyes are unmistakable. They did a great job. If, if, he, had, if, if he had ever existed as a, as a very uh, advanced fetus, he would have looked just like that. <laughs> um, but he's back on Earth. So um, he's not simply going to exist as, as the next form of humanity. He's taking he's taking it back to Earth. Yeah, what's he gonna do? I don't know. So so but you do you agree he's back, he's back over look, he's at least looking over Earth. I absolutely. I mean, I that know, is supposed I don't know what his to be are. Earth. We don't know what his intentions are. I don't is see any comments, Earth? but it's blue and white, and it's meant to be Earth, in my opinion. I think so too. I don't think it's meant to be an Earth like non-Earth. I think it's Earth. And I, th I think that is the most ambiguous part of the entire film. That's the part where I don't even think Kubrick had an idea. Uh, I think he's just like, we're going to, we're going to show him yeah. uh, in his, in the next stage of what humanity is to become. And that's all I know. Oh man. I mean, if you want to go with the Christ imagery, you could go like, you know, second coming, you could talk about, um, you know, he's going to reign over the earth. I mean, you get into like some really like theological stuff if you wanted to, <laughs> but I agree. It's not there. I think yeah. it's, uh, I think that's intentionally left ambiguous. Um, but I believe it's, it's the innocence in the, in the expression on the child's face mm -hmm. means that it's, it's going to be a really good thing. 